So when Tony asked me to speak in this session, he asked me to talk about reviews of literature institutions, I also talk a little bit about my, about my own work, so I'll try and do both. So I'm going to try and give you a helicopter tour of the literature institutions, I'll be deliberately selective, I will leave a lot of stuff, large chunks of the work will not be figured in that. I'm going to try to use the literature in the beginning to try and make an argument of how I, show my, how I can see my own work coming in. So it's going to be very selective in the first part, but let's get started. So the first part really, we go back pretty much to what Tony was talking about, really the 40, 50 years, uh, when we started thinking about the policy, failure of people substitution in, in many countries, you had the rise of the Washington Consensus that uh, Joe talked about earlier today, uh, liberation markets, good governance reforms, promotion of democracy, civil society reforms, and a somewhat naive view that market-based reforms can lead to economic progress. So that was what we really saw until the 1980s, and then of course we saw very important critiques. We saw an argument and we saw essentially experiences in, the, in, Af in Africa and America, the sector adjustment programs as it with the Island World Bank, was mainly not successful. There were some, some examples of success, but mainly not successful. Um, we also saw big bank market reforms in the, in the transition economies, not really having the desired effects, and often leading to quite significant increase in inequality, and sometimes even poverty. Along with that, of course, we had the more and no more evidence of the development of states in East Asia, which are strong and effective states that were interventionist and, and disciplined capitalists, and certainly not free market economies. And along with that, were really international efforts to fix governance problems through good governance reforms uh, and new modalities of aid largely failed, both in terms of outcomes, but also in terms of addressing the root causes of the problems of weak institutions and corruption and so on. So we, we saw all of that, and, and, and so at that time, then we saw this very clear institutional turn in institutional agencies. The bank was perhaps the first in this, with the 2002 WDR, building institutions for markets. And then very quickly followed DFID, the OECD, the IMF, DFID had a species paper in 2003. OECD is really good report uh, by Johannes Yatting in 2003. The IMF's World Economic Outlook 2005 is completely devoted to building institutions. So that was really a quite significant shift that you saw among the development uh, actors. But along with that, we saw this also this rise of the new social economics and IE. And that was really, and so, the, so the word new essentially was a separate from the kind of work we saw for the old economics of Commons, Weber, Mitchell. Um, and we had several people, several key players involved. I've just named a few. These are, of course, the Nobel laureates, Ronald Coase, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, Douglas North, Oliver Williamson, but there are many others in this, in, this, in this group. And of course, the kind of, so we saw very new theoretical work that came in from this, from this, from this set of uh, 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 economists, but also we saw a growing body of empirical research that showed that institutions understood as roots of, of, of the game in a society are central to understanding why economies, some economists perform better than others. We saw some very good empirical work, Holland Jones, 1999, Asimov Johnson Robinson, 2001, Rodney Silver and Terby are again some examples. But, and the commentary in this body of work was that the emphasis was on essential transaction costs and information. And the argument was that to understand, we have to understand market failures, we've got to understand the way transaction costs and, and information worked. And really, institutions essentially evolved to lower transaction costs in the performance economy. So this whole function, the whole focus was on how can we think of institutions that can lower transaction costs. And it was a very important body of work, and we got some great stuff from, great insights from this. But there was some limitations, and that's what I want to really talk about. The limitations were that, you know, if, if, it's, if it was the case that we have weak or poor institutions as a cause of growth and development, surely we could change the institutions. Why then do we observe the survival of apparently inefficient or extractive institutions? How and then do institutions persist once established? Why do we see part dependency institutions? So then at, at that point, there was a quite, quite a clear understanding that we could not purely focus institutions as a cause of development. We have to think beyond that. And I think the particular question Pranav Bhattan really captures it. Pranav Bhattan says, in a, I think in a, in a paper in World Development, questions of efficiency improving institutional change cannot really be separated from that of redistributing institutional change when issues of collective action, bargaining power, class conflicts, mobilization, and struggle in the historical process are important. You could not see institutions are historically, you could not see institutions are politically. That was really a fundamental insight we got from this kind of work that started coming in. And we had to understand the political conditions under which growth impeding institutions persist and why we very rarely see growth, growth enhancing institutions replacing growth impeding institutions. 
power and politics come central in understanding social change and persistence. Two <coughs> new books came along. This book by Asimov and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. It's a book that uh, David Cameron, the former British Prime Minister, was very, very influenced by. And also this other book by North Wallis and Weingast, two economic historians, Douglas North, John Wallis, and the political scientist Barry Weingast, Violence and Social Orders. Now, I would say that this, the first book, Asimov and Robinson's Why Nations Fail, if you really had to understand Asimov and Robinson's work, I would not use this book. I tend to find that the earlier art articles by them, the 2008 uh, paper in the, uh, the, in the Handbook of Economic Growth, is much more important, much more insightful than this book. This book is written for a very popular audience. But the second book was, in my sense, and this goes back to what we were discussing yesterday, an iconic book. Iconic book, it was an ambitious book. It was trying to provide a grand, unifying theory of development, bringing insights of history, economics, politics, psychology. We don't really get to see these books being written uh, today, as we saw in the case of uh, Gunnar Midda's Asian drama many years back. It was a, funda a fundamental book, and I think it really, again, essentially a game changer in understanding economic development. So what was really important behind these books and behind the whole new, new literature that came in on the question of politics and power? Well, the first thing was to focus on elites. Elites mark, make bargains between themselves and establish institutions that align the distribution of benefits to the underlying distribution of power. Institutions are not there by, them, by themselves. Institutions come from the power, distribution of power we see in a particular society. That was a very important insight we got from this work. So elite bargains give us institutions that shape world social, political, and economic change. And therefore, as a consequence, understanding this elite bargain, the question of rent seeking, rent, pit, rent, uh, rent management, we can understand why elites often use rents in civilized political powerful groups to remain on site, to be with them, and make sure they don't go, don't go against them, and build credibility to economic elites by essentially sometimes offering their property rights, or sometimes taking it away, or sometimes expiration, and sometimes not. So that, that first point was around thinking about how elites essentially manage rents between themselves. But along with that was also the understanding that elites, the way elite markets work is also with middle and lower, uh, lower groups, where essentially public sector jobs, club groups to particular localities gr uh, and groups, petty benefits for vote buying are a mechanism elites use to stay in power. So that was second insight that we not really saw a bargain between elites, but bargain the elite, elites and non-elites also. So that was very important in the way the literature then went. I'm going to try and summarize uh, Asimov and Robinson, but I'll just very quickly go through what I think the most important questions. The first thing is there's been a lot of focus on this point, that essentially we have this argument that broad-based growth is due to inclusive economic work institutions. Now, on the other hand, economic stagnation is due to persistence of extractive institutions. My own view is that just because the whole language and inclusive institutions is very, very fuzzy, as with Robinson, I'm not very sure it's very useful. For example, one could argue that China, which has seen spectacular economic growth, does not have inclusive political institutions. So in that sense, I'm not very convinced this particular part of their argument is very interesting. However, the part that I like and I think is very interesting is the second part of the argument. The economic and political institutions are determined by the political equilibrium, that is the prevalent power relations which will determine the set of economic and political institutions that are more likely to emerge. So these things essentially go back to the question of who has the power. Of course, they have a way of thinking about this which could be useful uh, in, a, in, in some sense, which is that you see here that once you're in a situation where you have inclusive political institutions, maybe democracy, uh, inclusive economic institutions, maybe inclusive property rights for, for all, all in the society, then you could be a situation where you're going to be or the time really somewhere here, path dependent. Or if you're going to be a situation of extracting institutions, uh, both in terms of political institutions, economic institutions, you go somewhere here, and if you're in one of the other two cells, you might move either, either direction. So that's a kind of way they, ha they thought through how exactly institutional change might happen, and that's very easily, nicely captured here, where they argue that essentially institutions evolve, drift, and then there's a critical juncture, and then you have institutional divergence. So that's an argument that where you can see that a lot of the old institutional economics argument or the historical institutions comes in here in the round argument around path dependency and then the critical juncture argument where something happens in society, whether it's a coup, whether it's a, a commodity price shock, whatever it is that leads to institutional divergence. North Valley's Vigos is perhaps, perhaps somewhat different, but I want to just kind of flag to what I think the main arguments are. So in their argument, Economic development is the transition from limited access orders to open access orders, LAOs to OAOs. 
In Elios, members of the, ruling, of the ruling coalition use their privileged position to create rents, which are the glue that holds together institutional arrangements between members of the dominant coalition. Violence is endemic in developing societies. The way elites try to keep manage violence is making sure there's a rent sharing between them so that nobody starts threatening the ruling coalition. Of course, com in contrast to that, we have open access orders where essentially the interaction between different elite groups as, as, as well as between elites and non-elites takes place in personal institutions and that the laws of law, rule of law is enforced impartially to all citizens. So you can see the contrast between limited access orders and open access orders. And obviously the, diff and the, the reason the economic development occurs is the movement from one society or one societal arrangement to another societal arrangement. And that will take place if elites need to find it in their interest to expand the personal exchange, and by doing so, incrementally access, increase access to the organizations that create and sustain ranks of society. So it's essentially the movement from develop, developing countries to, de to develop, develop countries is essentially a feature of where the elites decide that they like to make they want like to see rents increase access to others so that then we can go get to a point where we have impersonal exchange. What is striking about this argument is the following, that we had a view in economics that rent seeking is a bad thing. We had this from Kruger, we had this from Bhagwati, but this is a totally different argument. The argument is that rents are actually needed to keep societies stable. And rents are needed because you need rents to make sure violence is in check. This is a very different way of approaching rent sharing, rent management, which I think really makes us take us forward than the earlier view that rents by themselves are directly unproductive. And I think that's something that is very, very helpful. But there are some limitations which my work builds on, and that both frameworks try and explain long-term economic development, steady state growth, are not really about the kind of growth we see in the, the developing world. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So obviously, as Robinson Roberts emphasized colonial origins, we know the famous paper in the AR 2001, and not while is why there's only two successful countries who made the transition from a limited access order to open access orders are Chile and South Korea, no other country. That's pretty depressing. Um, and so then the, so the question I would like to pose, and that's one thing I'm gonna try and talk about in the next few minutes, is they're not able to explain medium term growth or what I would like to call growth episodes. The focus is really on long-term economic development, long-term per capita income to evolution over many years. That's the first problem. And then the, linked to that was, is the question, what triggers institutional change that can lead to growth accelerations or collapses? If you, if you agree that growth is not something that's steady state, it's not something that we seem to see happening slowly and, and continuously over time, how can we explain that we see these countries going through this periodic booms and busts? And how can institutional change help explain that? Now, the, the problem that in Asimov Robinson is that institutional change in Asimov Robinson occurs through during critical junctures. There's moments in time when something happens, whatever it is. And the problem is, in their view, this is stochastic. So they're not, it's not clear under what circumstances political could be that lead to economic growth will arise. Simply not clear. And that's a problem, because we cannot really imagine in such a change something that happens where a critical juncture is set exogenously and there's no endogenous reason why such a change might occur. That is not very helpful. And that's exactly why we need to go behind, it's, uh, behind the kind of arguments that we've been making around such a change. Second problem, and I'm thinking, again, I'll talk about, it's not very clear also the argument, perhaps more so as well Robinson, that what really matters to medium term growth are the, are the formal institutions, the rule of law, property rights that are absolutely codified, contract, contracting institutions that are absolutely set in, in, set in stone, are there other informal institutions? And again, that's not very clear, though I would say not by its wine gas, there's a much more better recognition of informal institutions. So if you just think about this, if you think about, let's think about level of income and quality, the level of quality institutions, we measure institutions which way we want, you can use bureaucratic quality, corruption, law and order, democratic accountability, and average of that, you can see fairly strong R squares between the level of income, the level of quality institutions, which is obvious. A country like the UK or a country like Finland's got very good institutions and under rich countries, that's obvious. The moment you start looking at the growth of GDP per capita, GDP PC, on the initial of institutions, you see the R squares drop to pretty much less than 10%. And then you start doing correlate the growth of GDP per capita, the changes in institutions, you get practically no correlation. 
So if the, if the argument really is that institutions are important for economic development, how is it then we don't seem to see the kind of correlation we might expect with the growth of GDP per capita, the, ver the variable we'd like to know about, more about, and institutional change? So that's a problem. Now, the other thing, so I want to just talk a little bit about why we should talk, think about growth in a different way. And I'm going to try and summarize very quickly this particular slide. Uh, I've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, and it's built on work that's been done by Ricardo Hausmann, by Billy Stirley, and Lance Pritchard himself. Uh, and it's just to, to make the point, why do we need to think about growth not in the way we often do in economics, which is about steady state growth? You've got to think about growth as essentially a situation where we have long run growth, growth averages masking distinct periods of success and failures. Countries grow and then countries collapse or stagnate. If you look at, uh, if you look at the distribution of growth rates in the world, versus any particular country, let's take the UK. And here we can see that the distribution of the world, in, uh, world uh, GDP growth rates are in this, in this bins, minus two, two, minus two to zero, zero to two, two to four, four to six, and more than six. You can see the distribution of the world comes pretty much lined up across these uh, six bins. And the UK pretty much sits in these two bins, which means the UK never has experienced over eight year averages any growth rate less than minus two per capita or more than four. The UK is right in the middle of this, and, I, and if you take any country in the OECD, the old OECD, they're exactly in that place. Most OECD countries, almost all OECD countries, haven't seen collapses, nor have they seen rapid accelerations. And then you take a country like Ghana, and Ghana is there in every bin. Ghana has seen remarkable growth collapses, and Ghana has also seen quite remarkable accelerations. So when you see Ghana in this way, and, and many other developing countries are in this, sorts of, uh, in, in, this, in this kind of way that we see significant failures called collapses and significant acceleration, then you start thinking, isn't that much more interesting to understand than understanding long-run growth? And that's the case that we need to think about growth in this following way. We need to understand what is it that takes a country from stagnation or crisis to miraculous stable growth? What accelerates or what ignites growth? And what is it that also, over a period of eight, 10 years, where a country might be growing, why do we see these collapses? Why do we see these periods where we see fairly stable growth, fairly, uh, even ra rapid growth, and then we say you see stagnation or, or a collapse? Why is it that only a small set of countries has stayed in these two boxes? And we know which countries they are. East Asian countries to a large extent, and along with that, Mauritius and Botswana. So why is it that we haven't seen, except for those sets of countries, most countries seem to follow this particular, uh, this particular pattern? So that's the question that we want to ask. Um, and the book that we have done together, with, I've done with Land and Eric Worker, uh, Land Pritchard and Eric Worker, is a book called Deals and Development, published by OUP. Adam is somewhere there, I, thought, I think. Uh, open access, yeah, <laughs> open access. And also I have a paper in World Development where I set out my initial thoughts on this particular argument, but the book pretty much contains, so it's a book that has the, our framework and it has 10 country case studies, five from Africa, five, five from Asia, then we have a concluding chapter which summarizes the lessons and the policy implications. So the, this book came out uh, uh, early, uh, uh, late last year. So now let's go back again to this, to this point. What is it that we should be thinking about when you think about growth episodes? The point here is that the pervasiveness of informal de facto institutions, particularly in developing countries which can neutralize or even counter the effect of formal institutions, economic outcomes, is central to the understanding of economic growth. There's no point thinking about good contracting institutions, no point thinking about rule of law, no point thinking about uh, effective property rights if you, do, if, you, if you do not understand what we really tend to see in the developing world are informal institutions doing the, doing the action. So here's where we focus on something called deals, which are, we are essentially are not rules, we dictate the terms of investment decisions. What are deals? Deals are personalized relationships between, relationships between the political, bureaucratic elites and economic actors. So a deal is a deal by its very nature, something I do with you, but not with somebody else. So these are invested terms that are, the relationships are selectively enforced. That is not the same thing as a, as, as a law, because a law applies to everybody. And to understand that, here's a set of figures which we take, I've taken from a paper by Land and uh, Mary Holloway Drive, which come on economic perspectives, and a quote that we get from a former Peruvian president, from my friends, anything, from my enemies, the law. 
Now, what do we see there? So we hear on this axis is the World Bank doing business indicators. So it's a kind of, it's a measure of uh, every country has official policy. What do you get a construction permit? Official policy, 30 days, let's say. That's what you see when you go to the country, the countries, the investigations will say, it'll take 30 days. But what you really tend to see in many countries, the situation where actually, even if it's official policies, whatever it is, if actually what we saw was that you live in the 45 degree line, we are not. We tend to see that we are in, on this part of the, of, the, uh, of the figure where pretty much often investors can get their licenses or permits in a very short time, no matter what the official policy might be. So that's the first point. The second point is, but yeah, that's, fi that's fine. But even within a country, the same country, you have investors who get the licenses in a very short period of time, and there are investors who take the licenses, as, law, as, as the saying goes, who essentially are to follow exactly the law. So it's telling us that this focus on rules, in this case of doing business indicators, is simply misplaced. What's really happening is possibly this kind of deals that investors are striking with bureaucratic actors, with the political elite, we don't really know because we don't have that kind of information in this data set. But what is really interesting is we see significant variation in deal making within countries. That's interesting. So that's a snapshot. So, what, so then let's take that argument forward. So here's the think, way of thinking about it. Understanding variation in growth requires understanding differences between countries with similarly bad institutions. When I say bad, I mean bad in terms of formal institutions. Okay, formal, either they are there or they, either they're there, they're not even enforced. So bad institutions in that sense. And, and therefore, we have a situation where we have a, a world, rule, the rules capitalism world, most of the old OECD countries, what happens to the typical firm investors determined by, primarily by the neutral application of policies. And this protects both, this, uh, this both protects property rights and allows for creative destruction. That is, it does not protect incumbent rights to existing profits. Well, of course, there are exceptions. We know that. Perhaps in the US, we're moving a bit away from this. Um, but on the whole, this is what we see in the old OECD. And explains a lack of variation in growth regimes. This probably explains why we do not see boom and bust in the old OECD countries. On the other hand, in, in what we call the deals capitalist world, which are most developing countries, if not all, what we see are essentially firm investor-specific arrangements, which is, has little or nothing to do with neutral application policies, because every specific relationship is a deal. This which would obviously means that this is subject to change depending on the regime, the leader, the administration, and business government relations, and we're going to now, and we're going to argue that deals themselves have very different features. We're going to say that they have what we call open, closed, and already sorted features. But the point, really, the important point that uh, that I'm trying to make here is, if you live in, if you are in this part of, the, if, of this part of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the slide, then we are in a very different world than the world we sometimes think that we are in. If you believe that rules or the rule of law essentially is important in understanding economic growth. So how, how are deals environments different? So here's, here's a two by two, okay? So imagine a situation where a deal that the political leader or elite offers to the economic actor. And in that situation, um, it could be ordered. In other words, the political elite offers the deal to the economic actor and the political elite makes sure the deal is delivered. That we call ordered deal. In contrast, you have a situation where we have a deal that's either that is offered to a particular economic actor which is either not delivered or cannot be delivered. We call them disordered deals. So this is a difference between ordered and disordered. Now, for some, some of you can see, essentially, I'm talking about the credible commitment problem. Okay. Now, on this axis, we have open and closed. And here again, there's a difference between open where anyone can make a deal and they can be certain that the deal will be delivered versus closed deals where only those with political connections can make a deal and they can be certain the deal is delivered. This example is an example of retail corruption. The great, uh, very nice example of this is a paper in Quarterly Journal Economics by uh, Marian Bertrand and Sergio Malayanathan where in Delhi, till recently, I believe, after they read this paper, they were changing this policy. To get a license, you could simply find an agent not go through a driving test and get your license. In fact, if you took a driving test, the chance of getting a license properly was much lower than going through an agent. Open audit deal. 
I want to get a license, driving license. I walk and find an agent. Give the agent some money. The agent shares the money with the inspector. You get your license. Okay, so that is open order deal. On the other hand, a situation where political uh, elites are essentially offering deals to only some the people they favor is a closed deal. And obviously, you can see that you can have open order deals, open disorder deals. Open disorder is essentially what you see in the informal sector, where often informal sector enterprises are, are, are promised something where they can never be sure they'll be, they'll be delivered. And a situation where we have closed disorder deals are essentially the situation of fragile states. The political elite might offer a deal, but cannot, cannot deliver the deal just because the situation is so unstable. So we have, uh, we have essentially in this two by two, two way thinking or way of thinking about deals in any particular context in a deals based world. So what does it take us? Now, the, the other two, I'm going to very go through this very quickly, is really just two other uh, parts of the framework. So I'm, I'm just really stripping the framework down to quickly explaining this other part, which is quite important for us, because we also have a way to think about rents, where essentially we have rents, in, again, by two by two diagram. Imagine a set of actors, economic, economic let's say, firms, or magicians who are essentially export-oriented sectors facing market competition. Or workhouses, which are small scale farmers, restaurants, retailers, who are essentially the producers of the domestic market and have also faced market competition. So, this set, these two sets of firms have different asks to the state. What do they want? They want the state to pretty much stay, stay out of the way here. They want the state to do things for them, like industrial policy, but they want a state where essentially would like the state to offer open order deals as much as possible. But here we have two other sets of firms. One are rentiers, who are essentially the commodity sectors, oil and gas, mining, and power brokers, who are in the non-tradable sectors, which are highly monopolistic, power generations, and so on. These sets of firms have an interest in closed order deals. Their whole, their whole survival really depends on making sure nobody else enters. That's what they survive on. And therefore, in a sense, for these two sets of firms, what they would really like to see are closed order deals. So that's one part of the framework. And the other part here is the political settlement, which we've essentially taken a lot from the work by, of Musta Khan and others who work in heterodox political economy, where the argument really is, and this actually goes back to also Asimil Robinson's notion of the political equilibrium. Uh, it's, there, are, there are overlaps and similarities. The argument here is that balance the distribution of power between contending social groups, social classes, on which any state is based, is fundamental understanding why is it that some firms, some capitalists, get some deals and others don't? And why is it that sometimes deals are delivered or not delivered? So we cannot understand deal making, we cannot understand deals or institutions without understanding the political settlement and also the rent space. The rent space tells us what firms want. This tells us what we're going to get to see supplied from the political elites. So that's essentially very important. And therefore, we, the way we think about this framework is we have, well, transnational factors and all which I haven't talked about, commodity price shocks, whatever they might be. The political settlement, the rent space, interact to give the deal space in any particular country, any point in time, and that can explain growth and social transformation, which then has its feedback loops back again here to explain why we tend to see this periodic booms and busts in economic growth. Okay, now, um, so I'm going to actually, I don't think I have much time, for, right? I'm, I'm, you know, not, okay, let me skip this bit, okay? Let me skip this. I just want to show you what we're trying to do here. So imagine the argument that we get to hear from Asimov Robinson and North Valley's Weingast. So the argument they make is, you know, you go this way. You have inclusive, so you go from extractive to inclusive institutions, or you go from limited access orders to open access orders, you get here, okay? And then you're in a rules-based capitalist world, which, as I was saying, in the NWW uh, body of work, essentially the Chile and South Korea's of the world. Okay, so that's essentially the way they see economic development occurring as you move from here to here, one direction. However, that's not the way it happens. That's not the way it happens. You could have a situation where you go this way, but then elites do not want to be in this space. Elites actually feel that this is not what they want because this would mean rent dissipation and rent destruction. Elites would prefer that you might actually go back here when they see a situation where this movement here is not something that's in their own interest. And this movement essentially of, uh, so let me go back here. This movement we see this way, maybe this way, 
but then back again this way is exactly what explains why we tend to see episodic growth. And we, in our 10 case, case studies from Africa and Asia, we document exactly how it's happened over time, over 50 years or so, for, every, for, for all these countries. Now, let me just sort of, you know, let me sort of summarize this in one slide. So what we are saying here, and that's very different from the literature on institutions and growth and, and economic development, we are saying that economic growth is episodic, which I think is pretty clear if you look at silence facts of growth, it's pretty obvious. But you're also saying that the business environment that we tend to see are defined by, rule, by deals and not rules. Which is different the way, essentially, sometimes the World Bank thinks about around the doing business indicators. And we're saying that even booms can generate the conditions for the next episode of, to be, of stagnation decline if, in fact, the political and institutional development serves to bolster non-growth enhancing elite interests. There's nothing linear about this argument, about this movement. There's nothing that tells us that once you're here in a boom, you should carry on. There's already things happening in this particular, in this particular growth episode that can lead to a situation when you can have a decline or stagnation. And therefore, decline can bring about more decline. Collapse and stagnations are the norm, not the exception in our world. And so what I just want to hear, just want to finish off, I, don't, I can't go to the whole slide. What I want to say is that we are in a situation where we have come a long way in the literature institutions. We moved away from a situation where institutions are seen uh, historically or politically. We are in a situation where institutions are seen to be politically determined. That's a big, big change. And certainly the work that we've seen from many people here have actually helped in that. But we still haven't got a good explanation of institutional change. This is what I'm trying to do in, in my own work, where in, the institutional change to triggers are essentially endogenous to the polity and the economy and not exogenously, not exogenously determined, not to due to critical junctures. Something that you can explain within the model itself. Also, and this comes to the, the question around policy, there's still this problem that we think to seem to think that we have to transplant best practice institutions in low-income contests rather than worrying about best fit institutions. Broadly calls the second best institutions. I don't like that term because these are not second best, these are first best institutions in the institutional context we are in. They are the best institutions you can do when you, which are essentially trying to work with deals rather than work with rules. But there is still a problem that we find that many, in many country contexts, there is this problem that countries are in pressure to try and transplant institutions that is seem to see in the West into their own country context. And so let me just finally say that Essentially, the literature that we come to is now in a point where the country's political settlement is key to understanding economic development. As economists, we've got to go back and try and think through this, because without that, there's no point in thinking about how economic growth, economic development can happen. Thanks. <laughs>